I think partly when you know when we talk about um, documentary and the perspective of non-indigenous people of indigenous media practices, you know, a lot of that begins with literature. It begins with the um, the letters that Columbus sends back to Spain, you know, in the 1490s. It begins with uh, John Smith in uh, Virginia, right? And and uh, in the 17th century we have John Smith writing and then what is it in 1995 we have Disney's Pocahontas right and then 2005 we have Malik's New World that replay these same kind of stories about the relationship between uh, indigenous people and media in the US. When you stereotype our people into one image you're not making us human you're not seeing us as a human being you know standing in front of you um, we're just a character we're just something for you to do you know to dress up as or play with, you know, and you're not seeing us as a real human being. If you look at the history of, of, of media about indigenous people by non-indigenous people, uh, much of it you find is really about non-indigenous people creating themselves, really creating a, an idea of themselves by drawing a distinction with indigenous people, right? And this becomes, um, I think, one of the unfortunate uh, say, uh, consequences of this process is that indigenous people get positioned in contradistinction to something like modernity or technology or progress or um, knowledge production, right? These kinds of forward-looking um, concepts. And, um, you know, it's an interesting position for a non-indigenous filmmaker to be in in that case, um, creating oneself through that um, opposition. So if you go back to Columbus, John Smith, and so on, and you see this even in the Disney and Malik films, there are these I iconic uh, descriptions that then become film scenes um, that are essentially um, contact between the European and indigenous peoples on the basis of sharing technology. So um, John Smith offers his compass, for example, right, to uh, the Pamunkey in the original text. And as John Smith describes this moment, um, it's a moment in which uh, the Pamunkey are amazed by the technology of the compass. They can't understand um, how it works. Uh, it doesn't um, seem to go with their worldview. And uh, it ends up, according to John Smith, right, framing their perspective of him as someone with um, immense power and a kind of mystical um, presence. Uh, the same is true of, of uh, moments in um, Columbus in uh, the Caribbean. And, as these kinds of scenes get reproduced in film later on, um, in, uh, in Disney's Pocahontas, this is uh, Miko the, the raccoon that plays with the compass, if you remember this scene, right? And uh, neither he nor Pocahontas um, understand what a gun is or what a compass is or even what a helmet is in the case of the Disney film. And it's these scenes that operate uh, metonymically to, to demonstrate that native people are sort of fundamentally divorced from technology. And we're not in or on the reservation um, just living there and not doing anything. That's a stereotype that we don't have jobs, that we don't pay taxes, um, that we're just drunks living on the land. And a lot of us are out here in the real world working jobs, being teachers, being journalists, being filmmakers, being lawyers, being doctors, and they're not seeing that. So um, once they see that side, they'll be like, oh, we're just like regular people. Of course we are were part of the experience here all over the world. Um, so it's important to know that other side, that's how stereotypes affect, you know, affect not just native people, but young kids as well, because they're you know, put into that mystical side of they should be uh, one with nature or talking with animals or turning into an animal <laughs> or something like that. And even today though, we have twilight, you know, um, making again a mystical figure um, in Jacob, um, half shirt, you know, on. He's, he's always doesn't have a shirt on and it's like you walk around Haskell, none of our kids are like that. They don't do that. These, these narratives about that relationship go further than just compasses or guns, right? They extend to film technology and so you end up with these bizarre ironies uh, like in Nanook of the North, for example, right, where we have uh, a scripted documentary film in which um, an Inuk man interacts sort of in a very confused way toward several different um, sort of Western 
quote unquote modern technologies, including uh, phonograph. And the irony, of course, is that at this very time, uh, who's standing really behind the camera? Not just Robert Flaherty, right, but a whole native film crew that's running the cameras and in fact knows the cameras better than Flaherty himself. So the, the irony there, right, that the, the screen separates this sort of real lived experience of native people uh, taking hold of media technologies and at the same time being represented as if they have um, no relationship to them except wonder and awe. That was the first time that it was a, a, actually a film that was made about tribal people and seen all over the world. And you have that scene by millions and millions of people and they can't get rid of those images, you know, because that's what's they, what they're seeing and they never met maybe another Eskimo or never met a Native American. So that's kind of what they're used to seeing and they can't get that image out of their heads. So they're seeing those types of films, they're seeing the cowboys and Indians type films and they expect to see us like that. They expect to see us in a headdress and regalia, um, you know, living in a teepee when some you know, tribes never lived in a teepee. Uh, my people lived in Pueblos and so Adobe homes, you know, that's not what a teepee is. Um, and the Navajos lived in Hogans, so it's a different type of living arrangement and people don't understand it. They just kind of group Native Americans into one big whole of people and it's not, that's not who we are. Um, is really um, pretty astonishing and the fact that, that those kinds of scenes appear in 1922 Right, but then also later on appear uh, in 2005, right, in New World. Um, they have staying power, these kinds of narratives, right? And it's people that grow up with that narrative. They reproduce that narrative in themselves, so. There have been um, different levels and different areas of film production um, through which what we might call the trickster gaze or um, uh, a kind of position of uh, survivance, as Gerald Wisner calls it, right, the white earth Anishinaabe. Um, scholar where um, either say for example indigenous actors uh, in films or um, indigenous uh, directors or others involved in uh, filmmaking will find ways to make particular interventions um, and I think there are several stances one can take but from the side of um, directing for example you um, you often find a kind of either or response. You'll have the smoke signals response, right? Sterling Harjo uh, does some work a little bit like um, smoke signals, as well as I think uh, the digital art of Stephen Judd is a really great example of this kind of uh, trickster response. Uh, taking ethnographic stereotypes and really twisting them in just the subtlest of ways, right? Feeding into them uh, really is a way to, to crack a joke at their expense uh, and to disrupt our understanding of them as a kind of authentic history. You then have the, what you can also consider to be, um, I, I believe, a trickster response that's really, really comes from a, more of a place of sincerity than irony. And a good example of that would be um, Aten Arjuat, a fast runner, right? Where the film production involves um, indigenous community at the local level at all stages of production. Uh, and I think that really from a position of um, counteracting a stereotype rather than disrupting it from within, uh, becomes a different kind of response. Films that are having a native theme to it or native part of it, they usually employ somebody who is a cultural advisor to that tribe. Um, and so I think that's probably the best thing you can do because again, all tribes are different. Like you wouldn't see a teepee in Monument Valley. You know, that's not what they live in. It would have been a Hogan. But a lot of people don't know that. Um, being you know, they know exactly um, home life, what they would eat, what they would hunt, what language they were speaking, um, and even what their clothing would look like because not all natives had the same, even hairstyles. You know, look at the Eastern Coast natives um, often had a shaved Mohawk type look, whereas Plains had long hair, and even in Oklahoma, they had a different type of hairstyle. So, you know, they would know what all those um, cultural things to address. So that would be my best thing to say is just always have an advisor that's relevant to that tribe.